Uh, I'm Christine Sandy, and I'm the Program Director of the Rural Health Information Hub, and I'd like to welcome you to, to today's webinar, where we'll be introducing you to the Center for Economic Analysis of Rural Health, or SEER. Um, SEER was recently funded by the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy, and we're really excited um, to help introduce uh, the Center to uh, the rural health community and hear about the great work that they've been able to do so far and what they have planned uh, for the future. Thank you for joining us today and I will quickly run through some housekeeping items uh, before we begin. Um, and we have provided a PDF copy of the presentation on the RHI Hub website and that's accessible through this, the URL that's currently on your screen. And we have also provided that uh, link in the chat function uh, if you want to look there. If you do have questions for our presenter today, please submit those through the with the Q&A button that's on the bottom of your screen. Uh, and we will take those questions at the end of, of the presentation today. Uh, we, we do anticipate that we'll have time for those questions. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today. Dr. Allison Davis is the H.B. Price Professor of Agricultural Economics at the University of Kentucky and the Executive Director of the Community and Economic Development Initiative of Kentucky, or CEDIC. CEDIC is an integrated engagement research center housed within the College of Agriculture, Food and Environment at the University of Kentucky. CEDIC's mission is to build engaged communities and vibrant economies. Dr. Davis leads a team of 14 engagement and research staff to support CEDIC's five priority areas, economic development, leadership development, community health, community design, and arts engagement. Her research program focuses on infrastructure investment, rural healthcare access, and economic development. Her engagement programs utilize workshops, trainings, and educational materials to highlight the importance of community engagement, land use planning, infrastructure development, regionalism, and the impact of changing public policy on communities. Uh, with that, please welcome Dr. Allison Davis. Allison. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, as I uh, mentioned, I am uh, Allison Davis. I'm a professor at UK and uh, the director of SEER. Um, SEER is a, uh, the Center for Economic Analysis of Rural Health. And this is our, our sort of our mission statement, which is to increase public and stakeholder awareness of the economic impacts of rural healthcare sectors on rural, state, and national economies as well as the vital relationship between community economic development and the health outcomes of rural residents. So I wanted to introduce you to um, my team. Um, I uh, have a wonderful partner in Dr. Brian Whitaker, who's a professor at Oklahoma State University. He uh, holds a similar position to the one I have at the University of Kentucky. His area of, of interest is largely around broadband um, development, economic development, and rural health. Um, and so he is a partner on several projects with me um, and a wonderful colleague. I have four um, folks who are providing support to SEER. Um, Ms. Simona Balazs, who is the research coordinator both for CEDIC as well as for SEER. She's got tremendous expertise in data and data analysis. Um, particularly in rural places and at the county level. Um, Melody Nall is my engagement coordinator and has a background in public health and has worked with AHEX, hospitals, networks, coalitions, um, you name it, in healthcare across, the, across Kentucky. Sarah uh, Boker is my communications coordinator and is the one who's responsible for asking, pleading for you to participate in our listserv so that we can get you information uh, um, in a timely manner. And then Mr. Ernie Scott, um, who is just one of my faves, he is the director of the Kentucky Office of Rural Health and is someone I've been partnering with um, since day one. Um, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my history so that it may help provide some context of why SEER is located at the University of Kentucky. Um, so I've been around for about 20 years doing this work. 
I used to work at the University of Nevada, Reno with my colleague, Tom Harris, who you'll see on this slide, is a member of our advisory council. Um, I was part of the Nevada Rural Health Works Program. And then when I went to the University of Kentucky, led the Kentucky Rural Health Works Program, which was an incredibly important um, program designed to provide support to healthcare leaders uh, to give them a platform and tools to identify and to um, send the message of why hospitals um, and local healthcare leaders and, and um, practitioners are so critical to the rural health um, economy. And so upon coming to the University of Kentucky, my research and my engagement work largely stemmed from that and then broadened um, to work a lot with our state office of rural health, um, with a lot of hospitals, um, to help them, again, think of different ways beyond looking at economic impact analysis of carrying that message about um, the importance of rural health and local economies. So since um, I've been at UK, we, uh, we lead the community health needs assessments for almost all of our rural hospitals in Kentucky. Um, we are a part of the University of Kentucky Rural Health Research Center and um, just to provide a lot of support around um, the network planning, outreach and development grants and working with health coalitions, but all within the context of how um, this is so critical to the vibrancy of small rural communities and economies. Um, we don't do anything clinical. We um, don't do any kind of training for healthcare providers. We are simply there to um, help folks think about how to engage their community so that their community understands how important the healthcare sector is um, and to help those healthcare um, leaders um, demonstrate their value to local communities. So it's, it goes both ways. So I want to introduce my, the advisory council for SEER. Um, it's a very strong advisory council, just tremendous um, expertise in their field. Um, so we have some academic partners. I had mentioned Dr. Tom Harris um, from the University of Nevada, Reno, uh, Dr. Steve Deller, uh, University of Wisconsin, and Mark, Dr. Mark Skidmore from Michigan State University. You'll see here we have some great partners from the National Cooperative Health Networks Association, Linda, Chris, um, many of you know from NOSOR, uh, Dr. Bill Alger, who's the Rural Health Leadership Radio and his podcast. If you don't subscribe to it, please do. Um, absolutely love it. He does just a great job of tackling some of the most important issues around healthcare and the value of promoting uh, leadership development for folks in that field. And then I have um, Corey and Ernie, both from Oklahoma and Kentucky, respectively, offices of rural health who provide important insight into what um, all healthcare leaders are facing. So I wanted to talk a little bit, I, this presentation is not gonna last an hour. I hope many of you are not disappointed by that. We want to just provide an overview of who we are and what we plan on doing, but most importantly, um, how we can provide the most value to you, your stakeholders and your local communities. So I wanna say, talk about what we do um, our goal is to respond to pressing issues that are facing rural communities. Um, and certainly they are um, not trivial um, and they're not few right now. Um, we work closely with our uh, Federal Office of Rural Health Policy, with the Advisory Council and other partners, both healthcare and economic development. Um, we uh, hope to provide timely, relevant and useful research-based tools um, we are not a rural health research center. We're, we're different in, in that regard. Our hope is to try to take recent relevant research and help translate it um, so that folks who are working on the ground can take this really important research and figure out ways to um, implement strategies that would improve um, conditions. So our tools are not just designed for healthcare leaders but they're designed for elected officials, for economic development professionals and community leaders, um, all to support not just the rural health economy, but the entire uh, economy. And in, in my work on a daily basis, um, it, it is um, absolutely crucial when I'm uh, wearing my economic development hat 
that uh, we have all those folks at the table. There's no reason to be having a conversation around economic development without having uh, the healthcare leaders present as well. And then uh, we, you know, our hope eventually soon is to provide face-to-face -face and online trainings and workshops. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of the trainings we have coming up. Um, but certainly we, we look forward to having face-to-face -face opportunities again soon. Uh, we would like to be at the NRHA conference. We'd like to be at some of the, um, the regional um, SOAR meetings um, to just be able to disseminate resources um, to listen to some of the pressing issues that folks are dealing with so that we can uh, quickly respond. Uh, we wanna be able to contribute to RHI Hub and the great resources that they have available there as well. So um, you all may have different perspectives about what some of the pressing issues are that are facing our rural communities. Um, right now, here's sort of our target of what we've been working on. This you know, can change when things change as well. Uh, but these are sort of our current projects that we've focused on. The first is um, to really understand the long-term impacts from COVID and not talking about access per se, but talking about the sustainability of our local healthcare um, system and what that means for the local economy. So uh, we are interested, you know, when COVID hit, and we saw that there were um, immediate furloughs um, in both urban and rural hospitals because they were no longer doing elective surgeries. The question remains how quickly and who bounced back to pre-COVID levels. We knew in some of our urban areas, it was a quick furlough and folks were, you know, came back on payroll almost you know, as soon as elective surgeries were back um, on board again. We haven't heard anecdotally that same um, discussion in rural places. In some rural places, we've heard that this was sort of the way to reduce staffing um, with already very constrained budgets. And so we are doing kind of a longer term study to understand those um, kind of long term employment and payroll impacts, waiting for all of the year end reports to come in pre and post COVID. Um, the other piece is we, we are working uh, with the Shep Center to, to use their financial distress index and kind of predict out, as well as to better understand how community characteristics, so how um, our local, um, you know, socioeconomic or socio-demographic um, characteristics affect hospital survival. The FDI relies a lot on hospital specific characteristics um, and a few um, community characteristics, but not really looking at um, predicted changes in population or income, um, employment, things along those lines. And so we think and we know that um, as communities in rural places continue to face um, economic distress, it changes, you know, the population growth. Um, declines, uh, you know, continues to decline. And so we need to have a better understanding of how those future trends might um, put additional rural hospitals at risk during a time that, that's already very tenuous. I think one of our, our biggest contributions to sort of the rural health research lately has been around EMS. Um, and I, I don't know how it kind of snuck up on us, but Certainly in the last few years, this became a, just a super critical, challenging issue about thinking about EMS services. Um, and we did some work a year or so ago looking at what happens when a hospital closes, what does that mean for travel time to the nearest, um, next nearest hospital. We've heard certainly over and over again, workforce shortages um, and the competition for individuals with EMTs, paramedic credentials. Um, I tell folks that I went to one place and I heard that Amazon was hiring EMTs and paramedics for their factory floors at a rate that was significantly higher than they'd be making at any type of service, regardless of the type of ownership. And so there's a tremendous amount of competition um, for those technical skills. Um, and just a rate of pay that does not um, live, you know, meet the sort of quality of life that's needed um, in our rural places. In many of our rural places, there's been a decrease in public investment. 
Um, and so those places that relied on public um, supported EMS services are just dealing with, um, you know, smaller budgets. And so um, it has become quite challenging. And as population continues to decline in some of our rural places, that will only become more challenging. And so we are really, we've done a lot of research around really trying to understand how ambulance services work, um, the optimal ownership type, um, the utilization, and then also um, the different modes. And so there's just recently been, I know for sure in Kentucky, a lot of competition between ground service and air service. Um, and air service is getting a lot more trips than ground service. And so that puts further um, pressure on, on budgets when you're not getting uh, as many runs. And so it's a really challenging issue and, and we're looking at it because it is one of those amenities in rural places that is critical. Um, you know, if we want to have a rural place that is attractive to senior citizens, and we say we want to attract retirees, if we don't have um, a safety net in place to ensure those individuals, if they face a time of crisis, if they don't see a way to get to the nearest healthcare um, community, then you're not going to be able to attract them to the community. So it is very much um, a health issue and it's also very much an economic um, development issue. Some of our colleagues um, just released uh, some research around OBGYN and our goal is never to duplicate, but just to complement. And this has been um, in my work in Kentucky, at least, uh, a really important conversation that as um, our hospitals and our communities have lost OBGYN practitioners, what does that really mean um, for long-term demographic shifts? And I, I tell my folks that um, when I drive through the state, which I do often, um, if I see a car that is flying by me, um, it is now assumed that that individual is in labor. Um, and that they have to get to the Lexington Hospital where they've had, um, you know, where they may have had a scheduled delivery date and now they are delivering early. Um, that can only happen for so long before it's a deterrent for new residents or for existing residents to live in a community. Um, and so what does this mean? We, we saw the research that talks about, you know, where this is happening, but what does this mean for the future vibrancy of communities if your strongest workforce, your working age population doesn't feel like they're in a place where they can support a young family. Um, and so we, we are getting ready to release um, an article that looks at uh, what that might mean. And then um, we started this research before COVID and it will only continue um, to expand, I'm guessing, but my colleague, uh, Brian Whitaker, looked at some research to understand um, as we've had all of this investment in EHR and sat now telehealth um, equipment and processes and software, um, how has this impacted hospital costs? As we keep trying to find innovative ways to increase revenue and to decrease costs, um, how has EHR um, impacted their, um, their situation? And we found pretty um, significant differences between urban and rural places, that urban places have seen sort of reduction to costs and rural places have not. And we looked very specifically at the type of um, EHR use. Um, and I think there's some interesting um, findings from that. And that will be coming out, uh, I think, very shortly, that, that policy brief. The, the other thing, and this is, we're just starting this, it's still potentially a little clunky, um, but we have been working um, for years now with a bunch of different databases. Um, I know in my work in Kentucky, how absolutely critical it is to have good data that's visually appealing, that tells the story that needs to be told. And so we, um, we have been working and will continue to work um, to make this as useful as possible um, to anyone who, who wants to use it but to provide um, a spatial visualization of you know, what we consider to be the important um, access, uh, affordability, and then the socio-demographic and economic data. Uh, we, we tend to talk about these two in a vacuum 
And I think we lose a lot of the story when we do that. And so our hope is as we deal with some of the restrictions that we have working for a university and on a university website, um, we hope to continue to provide um, these resources. I think this uh, was released um, officially a, a week or so ago. And again, I said, we're still working on this, but our goal is to provide um, reliable data that highlight at the county level um, different factors that we know are, are important for decision-making. So whether it's around rural healthcare industry, um, in terms of looking at, I, I know folks are still really antsy to think about highlighting that healthcare is often the largest or second largest employer in a rural community. Um, that hasn't changed. Um, it's still a really important talking point. So we wanna make sure you have access to those data. We know that in um, a lot of states, the hospital associations have been doing this work now. They've taken on the responsibility of doing economic impact reports for all the hospitals. So we really don't wanna duplicate that work. Um, we wanna make sure it's um, the work is being done well. Um, and in most instances, it looks like you know it is, but to make sure people understand what, what that report is saying or what it's not saying, but also to sort of equip with some other tools and data points. And so we have right now these five different um, categories and each one has a series of different variables that we've included. We have, um, when we created this map, it's just for rural counties and rural is defined based on HRSA's definition. Um, and so if you see a bunch of counties that aren't included, then they would be considered urban. We have all the counties. So if you um, ever needed to see urban versus rural, we can, but you lose um, any of the kind of visual aspects of this because it's such a stark difference in a lot of these situations. So we have, um, you know, employment and payroll um, and, and those types of characteristics under a healthcare industry. We have some access to healthcare looking at providers. Um, we have rural health characteristics that are stemming from county health rankings. And we have um, just some very basic socio-demographic characteristics, just looking at race, ethnicity, um, and poverty. And then our last one is ship share. And this is um, an economic concept that is essentially assessing the economic competitiveness of, um, of industry in a particular place. And, and one thing, um, anytime I go into a, a rural community, we note that healthcare is increasing, which we're all very proud of. But when we look at something like the ship share analysis that isolates, um, sort of a national boom to the economy, as well as overall trends in an industry. It sort of isolates how one place is doing compared to another. For me, that's a really important tool to assess how are we really doing. We may be growing, but we're not growing at the rate we should be. And so what does that mean? How do we, um, how do we use this information so that we can get up to speed? So that resource is available. We'll continue to refine, um, add data. The data will be updated. Um, it is a little bit slow sometimes to load just because there's so many different counties. Um, so just if you can be a little bit patient, any feedback, um, we're not sensitive about any um, criticism or feedback, so please send it our way. Any data that you think uh, you'd like to see added, we're happy to do so. Um, as I talk about data, I do want to talk about, you know, we know how difficult it is to find really good data for rural places. Um, and if you're in a tribal community, you might as well just, you know, forget it. So um, we do access a bunch of different data sources for, um, to fulfill this map. Um, and, you know, we'll use census data, but we know margins of error on census data in rural communities is really large. Um, for our economic data, we tend to use um, what's called Jobs EQ or Chimera, uh, which is again not perfect. It's now a very widely accepted um, database, but it's not perfect. And the more rural you are, the less perfect you are. But um, it, it's something that we've been using, and we've noticed a lot of governments, um, state governments, are using it as well. So we use that. Um, we do use the R funds. Um, so our R. Um, 
a database as well. So we try to list where all the data are coming from so that you have, feel secure about what you're looking at. Um, so I, I wanted to talk a little bit and, you know, again, I'm almost done here, which is good. Um, so we have a chance to answer any cute questions you might have. But we are, you know, we want to be as useful as possible and we don't want to duplicate the rural health research centers. Um, that's not the capacity of our team. Uh, we certainly have research capacity, but I think our team is particularly aware of that integration of research and its implementation in small places. And we have tremendous research coming out of our rural health research centers that gets widely publicized. Um, and I think we want to be um, a resource that helps folks figure out what does this mean for my little town in Western Kentucky with 4,000 people in a hospital that's struggling or a place that doesn't have a hospital or a place that just can't seem to find workforce or a place that's lost OBGYN services. So we wanna be that um, translation device just because that's what we have done for the last 15 years is be able to do that. So we will see as, as topics emerge from um, really great publications that are coming out of the centers, uh, we'll work with those authors to help figure out how we can help get that information in the hands of folks who are making local um, and state decisions. I know that um, folks are, are still really interested in understanding the economic impact of healthcare. There are a number of um, folks who are doing some work around this. And I, as I mentioned, I know in many states, the hospital associations have started doing this work for their hospitals. And I think that economic impact doesn't change very much over time. And so redoing that analysis or us having to retrain people over and over again is not necessary. I think what our hope is, is to be able to help you all think about how you tell that story. We know it's jobs, we know it's the largest employer, but what does that really mean? You know, when a hospital leaves a community, what other sectors go with it? When a hospital leaves a community, what jobs are replaced by it, right? So what's the quality of job? Um, what types of jobs? What jobs leave? What industries potentially leave? Um, so how can we make that story just a bit more robust? The one piece I think um, the, the second and fourth bullet points I think are particularly important. Um, and, and this is my role. I, I do a lot of professional development for economic development leaders across Kentucky. And um, nothing frustrates me more when I go into a board and do strategic planning or just do some training or you know, some type of technical assistance and there's no one representing healthcare. So our hope is to um, build capacity with our healthcare leaders so that they are leaders in economic development. The future of our healthcare sector and rural communities depends on how successful um, communities are in economic development. So by golly, we, we need to have folks at the table who understand the lingo, understand their role, what it should be, what it shouldn't be, what it can be, what it can't be, um, understand just terminology, strategies, all that stuff. I've seen places where healthcare leaders are um, absolutely front and center. And I'll give an example in uh, Kentucky, uh, although he's retiring uh, at the end of this month, Joe Grossman, who runs the Appalachian uh, Regional Hospital System, which is I think 11 or 12 hospitals now over two states, he considered himself first and foremost, and I hope I'm not misspeaking for him, an economic development professional. And so when I would go to communities and do economic development work, he was there at every single meeting. He wasn't there at every single hospital meeting. He was there at every single economic development meeting. He helped stand up um, stronger chambers of commerce. He helped fund an economic development professional across a region because that's how important it is for the local economy to be successful. If the local economy can, you know, loses jobs, the health, you know, healthcare sector suffers. And so we want to be able to provide support and not just for hospitals, for physicians, for nurses, whomever 
um, is, is a leader in a, in a healthcare community, we'd like you to, to think that this is really valuable. Um, certainly, you know, through our work with um, community health needs assessments, there's often as one of the priorities as folk, you know, as we continue to see the hospitals overutilize for non-emergent healthcare situations, um, when we do the needs assessments, one of the priorities that often comes out of it is that um, we need to find some after hours care, right? That doesn't put pressure on hospitals. They're not getting reimbursed at the rates they used to. Um, we need to um, be able to support um, after hours, whether it's urgent care or clinic or what have you. And so it's important to know like what, what is needed for that? Like what type of revenue, what's the feasibility of these new market services? Just because it's a priority doesn't mean that it's something at this point that, that we can do. And so we can provide tools for how to do that. Um, the other piece that's coming up, and again, this is one of the things that kind of slapped us in the face a bit, is housing. Um, and it's an economic development issue, it's a workforce issue, it's a healthcare issue. Um, and it has been largely ignored um, in many economic development conversations. And in talking to lots of rural communities, it is now the number one priority. Even though they call it economic development, um, they don't have housing to support um, teachers or nurses. It's like um, they forgot the low to middle income class. And so now we just have ho affordable housing and we have high income housing. And it makes it really challenging um, to keep staff uh, you know, at a place if the housing isn't available um, locally. And so it makes you more vulnerable to folks moving out to a place um, where that kind of amenity is readily available. And so we wanna talk about what does housing look like? How can you assess your housing needs? Really understanding housing data. We've done a lot of surveying around with um, different, you know, entities to understand, you know, what do we do about this? This is not a quick fix, it's not an easy fix, and it's not a cheap fix. So what, what does this mean? And so uh, uh, this is something that we're going to be uh, doing a workshop on soon. And I had mentioned sort of as topics emerge from rural health research centers, you know, what um, we want to be helpful where needed um, in helping to kind of translate that. So most importantly, that was sort of a spiel of who we are, but most importantly, we want to hear from you. And so I know we have a Q&A session, but I wanted to um, I wanted to ask you two questions. And so I'm going to um, skip out of here real fast. This is fun. All right, so it looks like we're just switching between the first three right now. It seems like. Um, so the first three, if you all can see, is um, provide economic development tools, provide economic analysis tools, and then translation of research. And the other two, and I know, I mean, I am not ignorant to the fact that there are lots of people working in this space. And so um, I want to be efficient and effective, and I've got a tremendous team, and I want them to be able to use their uh, expertise as much as they can. Um, so, wow, it's almost like a complete tie there. Um, so that's really helpful information for us. Um, and I know there's an other. And now on this next one, hopefully this works. Um, what types of resources would be most useful to you? And this is, you have to write this one in. Um, sorry about that, but I know um, I'm a fan of both quantitative and qualitative data. So thinking about, you know, and I don't think we're a replacement for the Rural Health Works program. We have a different kind of mandate, but I understand those tools that came through the Rural Health Works program are really important. Um, and so we are, um, we're here to, to see what we can do. So you can see as, as things come up here, um, just keep on going. I'm gonna leave this open for just a minute or two. Um, anything else? Okay, infographics, oh, infographics. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also a journal editor and we have um, an infographics um, theme and everyone has, um, there are some that really need help. And Sarah Boker, who's on, she does um, presentations on how to make great infographic. So I'm, I'm sure she'd be more than happy to help with that. Um, 
That's interesting. So I, I will say this is, and I won't give any names here, but there's one here that says description of the impact of a hospital's community involvement. And this is something that I will say, again, no location. Um, I went, I was asked to work with a hospital that was thinking about um, different funding mechanisms, public funding mechanisms to um, support their, their operations. And the first thing I'll do, um, and maybe I'm biased, is I go to their community health needs assessment because for us, when we do it, we take it very, very seriously. We work incredibly hard based on the IRS mandate to reach out to those underserved needy populations. Um, and we take it very seriously. So we go look at a CHNA if it's one we haven't done. And I opened up the CHNA and I knew immediately the hospital is not gonna have support. Um, it was very clear that that effort of being engaged and involved and communicating with the hospital, with the community wasn't there. And I think, um, and it was true. I mean, so when all went was said and done, the support wasn't there. So I think that is incredibly important. And I think, you know, in some places like, oh, we should start our involvement now because now we're in crisis mode it is too late. It is something that we have to do well beyond crisis mode so that it's genuine, it's natural, and it's impactful. Um, this is really great. There's all kinds of things in here. I am happy to um, I'll figure out. Um, yes, this is really, really helpful. Um, I'm happy to put this in sort of a, um, a document and maybe share it with RHI Hub who can send out. I don't know exactly how we can do that. But you can see um, info on housing, um, the tie between social determinants of health and outcomes, the description of, I mentioned that one, hospitals, community involvement, description of what others are doing and how we contact them, or yes, tools to spark conversations. Um, yeah, this is really, really helpful. And I think we're, it makes me feel like we're on the, on the right page because this is what um, we have generally in mind. And then Brian, you can see here, um, I know he's, he may have gotten off, but broadband efforts. I mean, we knew um, when COVID hit how how critical that was um, for patient um, interaction. This piece right here, we know employing X people has X economic impact effect, but how do we understand the less quantifiable? This is really, really important because as I said, we, we kind of get it now with the economic impact, right? We know there's a multiplier typically between 1.3 and 1.8 in a rural community. We know that it doesn't change much over time. Um, we, but what we've done in other places is really try to take that economic impact and surround it with sort of context of what does this really mean? Like you're talking about losing like 0.4 people. Like, okay, that's not even a full person. So what does that really mean? And so we've really tried to take that and add on some other data pieces, you know, other industries, long-term effects, commuting pattern, things along those lines to really kind of tell that, that more robust story. Um, so this is really wonderful. Um, I am I'm excited to see this and, you know, feel free, you know, to keep adding to that if you think about it as we go through the Q&A session. Um, full screen. So, um, so that's it. I mean, I, and I'm glad, I don't know what time is, I can't see the clock, but I think we have certainly have some time for Q&A. Um, one thing I'll say, cause Sarah is on and she would kill me, is um, we do have um, a website and there is an opportunity to sign up for updates and newsletters and things like that. Um, and we of course have to have um, Twitter and Facebook. And so if you want to follow us, here are our handles. I you now know how to say that. Um, so, and again, if you have things you want us to share for other people, we're happy to do that. Right now, we've been just doing a lot of sharing of others and trying to put it in context of what it means for, for local economies. So I think with that, um, I think we're onto questions. Great, thanks so much, Dr. Davis. This was, was great information and uh, fun to hear what you're, what you're working on. And um, obviously a lot of things that you've, uh, done a lot of work and thought, put a lot of thought into. So uh, we will uh, open it up for questions now. We do have a few in there already, but if you have additional questions, 
um, please go ahead and put those uh, in the Q&A using that little Q&A icon on the bottom of your screen. Um, and the first one, and I think you've, you talked a little bit more about this one since uh, the question came in, but if there's anything more uh, you'd like to say about it, um, can you say more about the center's vision for how rural health leaders can most effectively be part of the multi-sector community economic development mm -hmm. process? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I mentioned this a little bit. Um, they, I mean, I think, and you know, I use Joe Grossman's example that he was more of an economic development professional than a hospital CEO. I mean, certainly he needs his hospital to run smoothly, but he's got some great folks on staff to do it. Um, his job was to be a part of making the community more competitive um, and, um, more attractive for new investment and for ensuring existing industry stayed, including other healthcare leaders. Yeah. Um, um, let's see. So, um, and there's ways to do that. One is you have to be able to understand what economic development leaders are, are doing. Like, what are their goals? Um, what are their strategies? What is, you know, what does all this lingo mean? How is economic development done? How do we do incentives? I was doing an interview in one county and I um, around economic development and I interviewed the CEO and he was just tremendous. And he, um, he said to me, I would do anything to bring industry here. I can give incentives, I can do benefits, I can do whatever it takes. It was so critical to him again, to ensure that economic development was progressing. So there's ways to do that, but I think the first part is really having folks understand what is economic development and what are the strategies that are deployed. Some of our rural communities don't have paid economic development staff. And so there's no one out there sort of advertising, promoting um, the place to outside. There's no one ensuring that local industry is being supported so that existing industry stays where they are. So there's lots of different ways, but for me, that is one of the most critical pieces moving forward. All right, thank you. Uh, next question is, uh, what about the impact of telemedicine? Is that something you've looked at? Um, we haven't yet, but this is, um, as we've watched COVID unfold, I have to say it's given me a little bit of the heebie-jeebies. And it's wonderful to have access to telemedicine, assuming that you have the ability to access it. My bigger concern, and I know I'm not alone in this, is that now you've got big players who can now enter these rural markets, right? And so there is some additional competition. There's the potential to crowd out um, and now if I'm in a rural community and I know I can access, you know, someone in Lexington, Kentucky, an urban area, and I can do it via computer, um, I don't need to see my local, don't need to go to my local healthcare provider anymore, right? And so what does that mean for having folks stay there? And what does that mean for a local hospital? And so I think it's a matter that everyone can play together, um, but I think we need to, that just further um, sort of exemplifies why the hospital has to be engaged in community and not just being a place where we just serve people with emergent issues, but being a trusted partner um, so that when this, I mean, we already have seen places where this has happened. So it's not like I'm just making this up. We know that there is gonna be a great market for folks, for the big urban systems to come in. So, um, you know, and then there's the other side to make sure that we have the infrastructure in place and there's a ton of money coming to support broadband and telemedicine and distance learning and all that great stuff, which is wonderful. But, you know, there, we have to think of those unintended consequences. All right. Uh, the next question is, with all of the funding from ARPA, we need to get communities to work together to apply and prioritize the funding. Are you focusing on that opportunity? Um, we haven't yet focused um, on that at the national level. Um, we've seen a lot of it in Kentucky, um, you know, and my, my big concern is, you know, we're not very regional when we all go for money. Um, and so we become very, very county centric or place centric. Um, 
I'm happy to talk more about this. I know there's just going to be a ton of opportunity and in a lot of instances, rural places get extracted because there's such a good study area for stuff like this. And so people come from outside and come in and do stuff. Um, but if there's anything, um, you know, in terms of we're thinking about feasibility analysis, if now's the time because funding's available to do, you know, after hours care or, or additional equipment, you know, that's probably where we could probably fill that space. But again, happy to, um, to, to think about that if there's something specific. Great. Do you work to engage both public health and the healthcare system, or is your work primarily focused on healthcare delivery and its economic impact? Um, right now, you know, in certainly in, in the work we do in Kentucky, we, we certainly engage public health. And, um, you know, it'll be, um, Everything we use, I use hospital a lot in discussions just because I think, you know, uh, A, they're, I love rural hospitals and my little babies, um, but uh, they cannot act in isolation. And particularly with COVID, we saw the absolute um, importance of a strong public health system and the entire system as a whole. So, um, in terms of, you know, what does this mean for? Uh, local communities, um, a community can't survive with just a hospital, right? We, we have to be thinking about what makes up the entire system, whether it's mental health, public health, EMS, what have you. Um, I, I think having that diverse healthcare system is critical. Um, we have not done a lot on the economic impact of a provider, you know, a dentist or a nurse, what have you. I don't think that's the angle we want to take. We want to take what makes a community attractive to new residents and industry. And that is, you know, a robust healthcare system. So that's the angle that we would take. Right. And um, a related question is, how do you define who or what is part of healthcare? Uh, so this mm -hmm. uh, person says, we are involved in housing and community development for people with disabilities aging options other than nursing homes and the like. Um, so how, how are these issues, um, how they're addressed can affect economic development. So do you consider those to be part of healthcare? I hope so, yeah. I mean, if, if we think about, um, I mean, I think about community development in general, right? And community development um, requires this foundation of all of these services. Um, and as we continue um, to think about, you know, I, I know um, we've talked about rural communities trying to be a place for retirees to be attracted to. We've talked about a place now with COVID that we want to attract remote workers. Um, when folks decide to move somewhere, they're looking at the whole of something, right? They don't look at one single entity. If I'm thinking about um, moving, you know, I'm retiring, I want to see that this is a retirement, commu retirement community friendly, um, you know, community. So I consider it to be much more holistic than just healthcare. Um, certainly around mental health has been critical. Individuals with disabilities, we spent um, a lot of time a, a couple of years ago trying to help uh, employers understand the, um, the assets associated with individuals with disabilities as employment, as we have such a shortage of, of workers. Um, so that whole system has to be there. We can't just say, oh, we, we provide health care, right? That's, that's just one piece of it. So I would consider it to be much larger. All right. Um, are you planning to give hospital tools to define the why? Um, so that economic development is a strategy to address social determinants, to improve health outcomes and that sort of thing. Um, and how do you ensure that rural hospitals are aware of the carrots? That's so funny because I was wondering who asked this question and now I was correct in my, my question. Yes, definitely. Um, I, I think, um, and I think there are some really good case studies out there that now can help tell that story better than you know, an academic like I um, can. So I think it's so critical to understand that linkage. And you know, we put that in as one of the questions, like, do you want us to prioritize it? 
and not many people answered yes. And I'm hoping it's because maybe there are other resources out there that do that, as opposed to we don't consider it important because it is so important. Um, it is a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you don't take care of one, the other one will go down and it will continue to cycle out of control. So I, I very much think it's critical to help um, folks understand that strategy. Right. Um, and the last question here is, uh, with three hospital closures in the last five to six years, accompanied with the closure of their associated rural health clinics, we are the only FQHC in the area, um, and we're left with a huge burden of care coupled with downturns in the economy. We are working to address social determinants, shortages in staffing, and little infrastructure. Um, where would you suggest we find tools and suggestions to engage communities in finding solutions? Well, that's not a big challenge at all. <laughs> like, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, that is really what's going on, you know, all across rural, across much of rural America, particularly in those um, persistent poverty communities. Um, it is a big load to carry. The tools and suggestions um, in terms of engaging communities, the first thing I would say, um, is I am a huge proponent of the Rural Health Network planning grants. Um, it allows um, you know, a short period of time and it helps fund that conversation to some extent. Um, and we have, we have just sort of a myriad of ways that we do that. You know, we do it with all of our community health needs assessments. And as a community development organization, we are always trying to, for different engagement um, tools. So, I mean, certainly the easy ones are the surveys and the focus groups. Um, we have uh, done focus groups at the edge of a senior citizen swimming pool. We have done them in funeral homes. We've done them wherever we think those that haven't had a voice um, have that opportunity. Um, I think it's really critical that we engage all of the community. We tend to rely on the same voices over and over again. And so being able to go to those people who are most needy is, is really important. So we have tools that we use. Um, we are happy to um, continue to, um, to fine tune those to figure out exactly what you might be looking for. There's all different types of you know, democracy tools that are out there. There's all types of ways to engage conversation and, and get input from varying audiences. So I'm happy to follow up um, and find out more how we can be of, of use. All right. And I think with that, uh, we will wrap things up. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Davis. Um, and I would really encourage uh, everyone to um, watch for the upcoming uh, webinar series that SEER is, is going to be doing. Uh, and uh, Dr. Davis uh, helped us uh, review the, our recently updated uh, Community Vitality and Rural Healthcare Topic Guide uh, that's on the Rural Health Information Hub. And she was just a wealth of knowledge um, and so I'm sure um, you would all enjoy that upcoming series uh, to learn more about uh, their work and, um, and the economic impact uh, of rural health. Um, so with that, uh, we will wrap up. Uh, and I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, a survey will automatically open at the end of the webinar, uh, and I encourage you to complete that survey to give us some feedback about what we can do better next time. The slides used, uh, as well as the transcript and a recording, uh, will be shared uh, with all the participants in the next few days, um, and you can um, share those or watch again. Um, and that might be an opportunity where we could send out. Um, a list of those uh, responses as well. Um, so thanks again for joining us and I hope everybody has a great day.